This afternoon, we're here with Susan Kinsolving here at Grace Cathedral. Um, she's a poet, and she, she, we're so fortunate that she's decided to um, spend the afternoon here with us. Uh, I, I, Susan, I, I wonder if you can tell me about your childhood experiences of poetry. Um, what do you remember about poetry as a child, and, and how did this first start becoming part of your consciousness? I believe I was fortunate in my mother. Um, she was very fond of Japanese poetry. Um, she knew that I was starting to write little things, and she was encouraging. I was very lucky. She took me as a child to meet Carl Sandburg, oh, which was very exciting. He was still playing the guitar. It's kind of, you know, the yes. old American poet. But then by contrast, and to your geography, she also took me to meet Kenneth Brestraw. So that was very formative. And then I began um, writing as a child, and I never stopped. That's great. Robinson Jeffers, too, is a poet I, 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 who you know, strikes my imagination. His father was an Old Testament professor. Uh, he wrote a lot about the natural life of California. Um, was very um, interested in just uh, in nature as being almost a counterpoint to the inhumanity he saw in the wars. Yes. Um, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just you know, the, the kind of the social mission that, that, that um, poetry might sometimes have, or um, poets that speak, speak to you uh, in, in particular. Well, you started on a very close note. I'm a big Robinson Jeffers fan. I was very lucky. I gave a reading in his house one night. There was a huge storm in the Pacific, yes. and I was there in Tor House oh, reading goodness. his poetry. Yeah. So that was a very special m moment for me. I felt very connected both to the rapture of the Pacific Coast, to his sense of it, and I must say to the sorrow of much of what we have done to the natural world. Um, I have seen it as a child in California. I remember the last orange grove being ripped out of Orange County. Right. So some of that is very much um, what I might call a philosophical, political, ecological quest in my work. I'm um, particularly moved by the natural world. It's the place where I find the greatest sense of spirituality and uh, a connection to both of my own before and after. And so I, I love that, but the sorrow of it is profound. Yeah, yeah it really is. I, 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 I think it's um, so powerful the way we've seen the earth change in the course of our lifetimes. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how poetry has changed, just in, in terms of um, what are some of the challenges that poets face now? I mean. Um, it, mm. it, it's a different world than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Well, one thing we face is that no one wants to read. Oh, that's and that's really true. There are far more people writing poetry than reading poetry. And I am a teacher. Uh, I teach at a prep school in New England, but I've taught um, graduate school, undergraduate, also taught in a men's prison. So I've seen um, relationship to language literacy um, have a big cultural change, um, certainly technology. I mean, that's kind of an obvious issue. But there's not the level of listening. And I'm sure you see this also in terms of prayer yeah. and the church. Um, and listening to the fact that words not only can explain us, can elevate us, but they can also offer the elusiveness of what it is to try to understand our own being and the large world. So much of that real investment in language, I think of even my grandmother, had a much greater investment in it um, than probably I do. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm proud to say my children are readers, all of that, but culturally, we have changed away from language and away from a real respect for it and wanting to have it not only as a gift, but as a tool, and even, if you will, as a weapon. Yeah. I mean, language can serve us in so many ways, but there's not the same investment, I don't believe, but then maybe I'm sounding very old. So. Well, I mean, I, I worry about that myself, too. I, I, I heard a wonderful interview with Margaret Atwood, the, 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 the novelist, uh, and she said, the person asked her, um, what effect is, is, uh, is social media having on literacy? And she said, well, in order to work social media, you have to be literate, you have to be able to read. And then she did talk about, I mean, there is a way in which people are writing a lot more. It may not be, yes. like, you know, it may be, you know, see what Rihanna's wearing at the Super Bowl. Yeah, but, right, but, right. Um, it, but it, uh, it is, it, it's, a, it's a changing environment. I do, I, um, my daughter is doing a, a lot of library work, uh, reading letters that were written in the 20s and 30s. And there, you're, you're, you're right, I mean, there was a, a literary culture that, that was accessible to ordinary people that we just, that it's, it's so exceptional. The people who are in my life who, who have that gift, I, I treasure them so much more because it, it's so rare now to, to be able to have those powers of expression. So rare to receive a letter. Yes. Um, I have my creative writing students write a letter, and I'm even astonished. Some of them don't know how to address an envelope. Because they, now, I will say, they can help me with my computer in ways that I cannot. So I have to give them that. It's a different skill set. But when they write these letters, they usually write them to a grandparent. Sometimes they write a love letter. But they're always amazed at the profound reception, the, the delight someone has yeah. in such a gift. So, right. So there is, there is that also, but um, it's a changing world, and it is a changing world for poetry. Um, I judge a very big poetry contest for the University of Mississippi, and it is fascinating to me, out of, say, 350 submissions, only two will not be in free verse because many people have, they don't even understand right. that there is formal verse. Exactly. So to- um, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's extraordinary. It's just a difference. Of course, Walt Whitman be delighted. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's exactly right. But I wonder if you have a poem for us today. Um, I would love to hear what well, you have to share. Um, let's see, with that. I don't have an ocean poem <laughs> with this ocean behind me. <laughs> Well, actually, come to think of it, I do. Wait, wait, I was going to um, read wintry poems since I'm from New England yeah. uh, now, but uh, here's a poem that I think I can find. Oh, no, it's in this book. Yeah. I'm glad you travel with your library. Well, I traveled here with it. Usually, yeah, I don't. Thank you. <laughs> but this was actually on the California coast in the Carmel Highlands. Yeah, exactly. Up, 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 up. And um, this is entitled On Spindrift Drive Great. One Night. I know where that is. You do? <laughs> yeah. Well, and this is actually anecdotally true, although I often tell my students. Poems are acts of the imagination. They are not autobiography. But this has a much truth in it. A 35-foot weight crashed through the house, smashing windows, pulling a pillar into the ceiling and sweeping the desk out to sea, where strewn with kelp, it floated away to rewrite that nightmare into a dream. Years have washed over the details of my timely escape from that rocky precipice on which I lived. Yet I often yearn to retrieve one book, an unabridged dictionary, a grand old Webster's second, 
Sometimes I picture it still in the salt water, all 2,289 pages rippling and disintegrating, a plankton of syllables drifting from pronunciation and redefining each entry as food for fish. Perhaps that is how the book will be returned to me on a platter of protein, bone, and etymology. I would eat it with exactitude, separating the skin and skeleton, one meaning from the meat of another. I am but a beachcomber, pocketing sand dollars, broken shells, hoping for a phrase. I envy the oceans, endless lexicon, nameless derivations, fluencies, unfathomable piracies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you. I certainly didn't intend to read this, but with this You're backdrop, inspired. I didn't think I could do a snowfall. So. Well, here we are with Susan Kinsolving, and my name is Malcolm Clemens Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral here in San Francisco, California. Thanks for watching. More good news.